to that man talking. Tonight's story is the return of my own series, and I think I've got everything tied up nicely with the previous episodes, and now it's ready for you guys to sink your teeth into. As ever, please do let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled The Backpack Off the Trail Part 4 Let's get straight into that. After calming down and sipping some fine moonshine, we each explained what our purpose was for being this far out into Bond Swamp. The old vet nodded and listened carefully, raising his bushy eyebrows, now and then as I recalled our journeys. Eventually, though, the anticipation of the old vet's story was overwhelming me, and so, as the conversation had died down and everyone seemed to be relaxing, at last, I asked the old man what was his name, why he was out here, all alone, and how do you know that the smoke grenades would help us escape a horrible death? And what he then told us shocked and intrigued me all at the same time. I'll do my best to recount his tale. All right, I'll tell you. Since it looks like we've got a common enemy and y'all ain't going nowhere fast. Still, you could have picked a better weekend. And he paused for a moment before, flashing us a crooked smile. He continued and began packing a brown pipe with a heavy wad of tobacco before lighting it and then sitting back in his rickety rocking chair. After blowing a large cloud of smoke up to the ceiling above our heads, he continued. The name's Tick. Sniper Roger Tick Bennett. And it was the summer of 1973 and things were a lot simpler then. And I was a young man of 22 years old. Drafted to the war in Nam and full of vinegar and pride. Old Tick declared as he gestured with his pipe in hand, and then puffing again before continuing. Now, as scared as I was, I was a big believer in the Lord and him having a plan set out for me, regardless of the Viet Cong. I was sure the good Lord would see me back home and safe to my girl once more. Well, Tick paused for a second before finding his words once more. Turns out that he did in fact have a plan for me. One that I could never have imagined. Hell, maybe at that stage it wasn't a good lord and maybe it was the work of the devil himself. Either way, I'd have to think it was the lord's work that brought me in this journey. Tick added as he poured another tall shot glass of shine. Anyway, we were out on a scout mission working off a three-week-old intel of a VC encampment a few clicks west of our base. Myself and two other snipers, Bob and Marty, we were given the orders to infiltrate the boundaries of a camp and then hit a number of high-profile targets. I was the real deal, and a very cool-headed guy, working under extreme pressure situations. I worked my way up to sniper scout team and USMC gunnery sergeant at the 2nd Division Marine Corps. So to me and my comrades, this was business as usual. Uh, at least that's... That's what we all expected. Now we left base at dusk, headed straight into the thicket and trees. Most would see this as a one-way trip, given our odds of not being spotted and caught. But we were fearless and had stared death in the face many times before. We would comb our way slowly together for the first two miles and then split up and fan out for the final two-mile approach. Now what made it tricky was there were a high number of enemy soldiers spotted in large groups in and around the enemy base. Now, of course, we knew what our intelligence saw was only a fraction of the true number of soldiers that weren't underground in the tunnel systems and camouflage dugouts that they so liked to install throughout the jungle. Add the vicious point traps of fighting and damage capabilities, ah, the pressure was on. I actually preferred working by myself, as you can see. Tick said, pointing all around the cabin and laughing a hearty chuckle. Anyway, 
we made it to the two mile point of which we split. Now, although we were splitting up, in actual fact, we would only be around 50 or 60 feet away at any given time. I made my way low to the ground as possible before laying down and crawling on my stomach the rest of the way, taking the right side of the encampment. No, they were completely unaware of our presence. and They were laughing and joking about with each other and sipping some kind of alcohol. I found my first target and made for the perfect position, awaiting the signal from my comrades that they were in position and ready to roll. After a short spell of no more than five or maybe ten minutes, there was some seventy feet away across the enemy encampment came a glimmer of light. It was subtle enough that if you had not been looking, then you would have missed it. Now, this was Bob, letting me know that he was in position and had crosshairs on his target too. I responded in the same manner and we waited for Marty's signal. Now, after another five minutes, I was starting to get concerned. There was zero sign of Marty and our targets would no doubt move position again at any time. Causing Bob and I to have to move position and risk being spotted ourselves before we got the drop on our targets. And so, we waited. And we waited, but still there was nothing. Now it was around this time that I noticed how quiet the forest had gotten. I mean, this was a tropical forest and up until that moment, it was constantly buzzing with noise. Pun intended. And especially at night. But now it was absolutely silent. Now through my scope I could see the VCs also looking around. Some taken to higher ground and looking slightly nervous. My target, who happened to be the general, started to bark orders at his men and the group of around 30 men dispersed all over the encampment. They drew weapons at the ready and visibly were shaken. I remember thinking to myself as I hunkered down slowly, following my target through the scope. Well, I scouted into him. If they discovered Marty, what do I do and why is it so darn quiet? Moments later, my questions were answered in the most grotesque, violent manner one could ever imagine. At first, they came a long and drawn out howl way off somewhere deeper to my east. Well, it sounded large. I mean, it sounded like a giant was waking up and stretching his arms and legs with an almighty roaring sigh. And then the silence returned seemingly sinister in comparison to moments before. The hairs on my arms and neck stood up and, well, the air, it felt electric. The enemy now audibly panicking as men shouted unintelligible words of God knows what and rushed to their posts. Searchlights began curling the perimeter and I had to press my face into the dirt and pray that I wasn't spotted. As I did so, there came another chest rumbling roar from the south, and then the report of a M40A1 sniper rifle, Marty's rifle to be exact. Two more shots rang out and then I heard the most god awful scream. And by now the men had shone their searchlights onto the steep hillside that Marty was positioned on, and they lit the place up like it was a Christmas tree. There, standing menacingly over a cowering and panicked Marty, stood a killing machine. This beast must have stood at least eight feet tall, although I was some distance. But hey, I'm also a sniper and distance was my middle name. It was covered in black hair and from head to toe had a large head with two pointy ears on top. I couldn't see its face as it had its back to me. Its arms were too long and looked to be tipped with formidable claws. Realizing that my enemy's attention was on my comrade and that beast, as Marty poured his pistols, I searched with my scope for my target in amongst the panic. The beast roared in pain and anger, falling to one knee as another loud sniper round went off and this time it was from Bob's position. Now the creature regained its composure quickly as Bob lined up another shot Missing the beast's eyeball only by a fraction, but severing the long black ear on the right hand side of its enormous head. I growled a breathy and sinister growl and wasted no more time taking shots from Bob or poor Marty. In a second, it swung its right hand down and crossed Marty's arm and rifle, and both were smashed to pieces and flew off into the nearby vegetation. 
I then found my target, the General. His headlights lit up the forest on the west, northwest corner, and he was jumping into a jeep. Clearly, he was keen to get away, and I took the opportunity to make sure that he didn't. Hell, Marty didn't deserve to die in vain. And so I lined him up with my M40A1, red field scope, and then taking a deep breath in and out, I settled myself and found my mark. Before the echo rang out across the holler, his brain pan exploded and he slumped to his right. His men are diving out of the jeep and scurrying away for cover. And then again, that long mournful cry shattered the silence of the forest as I looked to Marty to see the beast raise his almost lifeless body high into the air before driving his claws deep into Marty's stomach, just above the ribcage. Then seconds later, yanking out his insides to the forest floor. Just before I did this, Bob fired a well-placed shot into Marty's head, giving him a mercy kill instantly before he could truly suffer anymore. And so I lined that fucker up in my sights and I began unloading my 10 round drum all over him. The beast shielded his face and chest as best it could with its arms and hands, but my wrath, I was furious. Bob joined me as we began firing on this nightmare a round at a time. Moments later, he decided enough was enough, and it ran for the encampment and jumped the 12 feet razor wire fencing and surged into the men with an otherworldly power. We were able to grab at one guy and another and crash their heads together with such force they exploded like a baseball bat to a watermelon. Others tried to run or hide, but it was useless. He kept coming as men fired on him before being utterly destroyed. I mean, within minutes, the encampment was filled with cries of anguish, pain, blood and body parts lay strewn all over. I witnessed one young man who was nearly cornered by the beast, attempt to escape by jumping down the well and narrowly avoiding those formidable claws. I'm sure he broke both his legs at the bottom. Moments passed as the carnage continued and I could see reinforcements arriving from the west and southern ends. Men poured into the encampment and were shocked by what they saw. I realized we needed to make a hasty retreat and so I began once more making a slow crawl on my stomach back the way we had came. Although this time I cared not if the enemy saw me, we needed to get back to base camp and some four miles away. My comrade Bob had had the same thought and abandoned his mission, eventually spotting each other as we made our retreat. And behind us cries and screams of men grew more and more distant, until eventually Bob and I came to a small river, a mile or so away from the encampment. Now by now it had been ten minutes and the screaming, although distant, was becoming less and less prevalent. My only guess was that the beast had slowly run out of victims as it searched the base. We gotta pick it up, Bob, I said as I realized if it had run out of victims back there, then it was most likely hot on our heels. We were sweating like nobody's business. Hell, I'm sure it could smell us. No problem, responded Bob. Cool as a cucumber as we jumped far on logs and ducked under vines and branches. As soon as we got within a mile of our base camp, I felt it. Eyes were on us and I had a good idea whose eyes. And Bob looked to me as we ran down the game trail into a valley, and from no more than 50 feet behind us, birds burst from the canopy of the trees, flying sporadically and haphazardly as they screeched and flew high into the sky. Both Bob and I stopped and turned in unison. The tops of the trees, or they were bending and swaying forward as if something was jumping from tree to tree moving fast and getting ever closer to us. Oh shit. We both shouted aloud as we turned on a diamond began running like hell's fire was on our heels. Lose the equipment. I shouted to Bob to unload a heavier inventory that he was carrying as I myself done my ammo and unnecessary items. The crashing and rustling grew louder as the beast gained on our position. It's cavernous chesty growls now audible and sending fear piercing through me. There was just another bend in the trail and we would see our watchtowers, when suddenly we were blindsided from the left. 
Bob flew into me as a massive black hair and claws swamped us both as we crashed into the ditch on the right. Now Bob had taken the brunt force of the attack and lay awkwardly to my right some ten feet away. He was half conscious and looked broken with his limbs laying in the wrong places. Now within seconds, the monstrous brute appeared from behind the tall grass behind Bob and snarled at me. I drew from my sidearm and fired six successive shots into his chest. The impact stunned him, but he just reacted violently and tore into Bob's chest with a sickening, wet, tearing motion. Poor Bob's eyes flashed open wide as his insides were ripped and pawed from his stomach. I quickly shot Bob in the forehead, trying to give him a mere mercy kill before the beast could continue its attack. My shots must have caught the attention of the watchtower guards as a second later the spotlights were on us and focused all over our position. Now, a mere five feet between I and this creature, and with a strong glaring white light displaying it in all of its nasty glory, I could see every last detail it possessed, from the time old battle scars and its black gums and black tongue, to the bits of pink flesh stuck in its claws and enormous waffen teeth. A growled a breathy and sinister growl and leaned down towards me, and I'm sure it wanted to intimidate me before killing me too. Matt seemed unfazed by the spotlights and took a step forward onto Bob's lifeless corpse. I reloaded and began to fire my remaining rounds at his head, neck and chest before click, click, click. My pistol made it jammed. Oh, fuck me. I shouted as I threw my pistol at the beast's face. It sneered a look of frustration and enjoyment as I drew my carbile blade and stood to meet its evil gaze. Come on, you mangy mutt! I shouted, readying myself for whatever was about to go down. Now I was first to attack and made a stab in motion for the beast's big red eye. I was rewarded with a slash of its claws across my chest. Blood and pain seared all over as I was knocked ten or so feet into some long grass. And as my vision swam in and out of consciousness, I heard base camp clamoring and shouts of more searchlights woofing to life, scanning the brush and tree line and finally hitting us. And as I thought my time on this earth was done, as that great hulking lump of muscle and madness stood above me and pressed its foot down onto the back of my head, my face was partially submerging into the wet earth. I heard it sniffing like a damn dog before it began leaning down and sinking its teeth into my shoulder. And just as it did, the guards closed in on our position and were jumping out on foot from the jeeps. And the wolfman, well, he dropped me in response, turned and growled as men started shouting. The buzzing of bullets and the rapport of their counterparts whizzed and cracked into the night air. There was a couple of dull thuds that I'm sure now were those bullets finding their target. And without a second thought, the great beast howled into the foggy night and leapt into the adjoining treetops. I craned my head as he left the area and watched the treetops bending and swaying as he did so. Tick sat silent for a moment, his old eye misting over. There's no doubt he was reliving that moment all over again. Well... As exhaustion and bloodlust began to finally take a hold of me, the last thing I saw was three troops jogging towards my position. I cracked a crooked smile as they reached me and made out a gasp before all faded to black. Wait a second, wait. Are you saying that... I commented, suddenly realising that, oh Tick, well he was in fact a werewolf. And this was his story of how that came to be. As shocked as we were, at the same time he didn't come across as threatening or devious in any way. A character, yes, but sinister? Not a bone in his body. Well, I know that now for a fact. Anyway, he continued. Ah, it's okay. I won't harm you and the days of the beast controlling me are far behind me. And so were... Uh, where was I? Oh yeah. When I came back around, I was in the middle of an operating theatre. Tubes and all sorts were stuck into me. 
the loud beeping and a team of guys with scrubs on audibly panicked and raced to restrain me to the gurney. Their eyes were wide as saucers. Next thing I know, I'm hit with a sedative and it's a wrap. First class ticket to Babylon. I don't remember much of what happened after that. I then awoke a few days later from what I could work out. I've been in and out of it for more than two days since the Operation Theatre, uh, theatrics. Anyways, I managed to sneak a snippet of information from one of the nicer guards. He said he had been watching my cell since two weekends before, that I had mainly slept those first four nights and days. He said multiple times I awoke and began convulsions and some type of seizure, foaming at the mouth and horror salts. Damn freakiest thing he ever saw, apparently. Anyway, as I described, I was unexpectedly locked in a cell, with bright fluorescent strip lights hanging high above on the extra high ceiling. A cheap bit of padding on a cold ass concrete floor for a bed and a lavatory in one corner. And there were thick steel bars that held me there as a prisoner. And <laughs> for what? For doing my job and getting caught up in whatever the fuck was going on down in the Viet Cong jungle? Hmm. <laughs> Tick, or to be sighed as the frustration was pouring out of him. And then he continued. Soon it was clear I was going through some serious changes. My appetite was shut, and I refused to eat any of the gruel they slid into my cell. In my sleep, I shredded the bed covers and padding, leaving long claw marks etched into the concrete floor. Huh, you ever woke yourself up snoring really loud? Well, try waking up because you're howling too loud. Even that one surprised me, Tick said with another hearty chuckle. Anyway, soon the guards were keeping a distance and limited any or all interaction with me. I was going insane. Slowly but surely, I was going cuckoo. Some days they just leave me be. Others I will be awoken at an unreasonable time, say 4am. They'd rush myself with full riot armor and twist me up before sedating me. Not a week later, strapped into a medical chair. Bright lights and a team of specialists buzzing around me. Some taking samples and others prodding me with God knows what concussions. And across the room there was a clear perspex screen between I and a room full of high-ranking military and navy personnel. And they watched on with bated breath as the team carried out their experiments. <sighs> and then came the night that I will never forget. No matter how much shine I drink, it's burned into my mind forever. Now, once again, they busted in on me as I slept, proceeded to drag my half-conscious body down the hallway and into another room. But this time, it was another room altogether. They scooted out the door before clunk, locking it behind them as I heard their heavy footfalls move further and further away. I tried to stand and stumbled a few times, trying to get my bearings, looking all around and I could see that I, I was in a large dark chamber, and the ceiling once again was high, but this time there was a skylight of sorts, and through that skylight I could see the full moon basking a thin strip of moonlight down into the chamber to meet in the center with me. Well, very suddenly, one of those red alarm lights that you see in movies began whirling around and a klaxon sounded. Uh, the wild to my left began moving away, sliding horizontal and revealing a room filled with onlookers of all manner of business. I remember their cold, steely eyes staring me down. Even then I knew something bad. Oh, it was about to happen. I mean it had to, right? Angry mob. Check. Strange, ominous, dark room. Check. A feeling of impending doom? Huh. Check. As if almost on cue, another door opened up and four guys threw a guy in and onto the floor before literally running for their lives. Within seconds, this unknown guy gets to his feet, takes a breath in and then out real slow. I swear on cue, as he opened his eyes, or they shone a bright red. My own heart turned cold and my pulse raced as he began to circle me in the shadows and tear his clothes off. I looked for a weapon or something that might help me, but by the time I looked back, he was inches away from my face, growling almost like a big cat but mixed with something more sinister. He had threads of drool 
that had already began hanging from his mouth, and I watched as his face stretched and skin tore away as his skull began to change. I stumbled back on my ass, scrabbling to escape, but it was no use, and within seconds, this man was no longer human. Before me stood a seven-foot werewolf, and boy, oh boy, did he look hungry. Now, before he could strike, the loudspeaker came to life, and a baritone voice commanded, Engage! And then a shrill, high-pitched noise blasted through the speaker, when I suddenly felt my entire body was on fire. My hands and my feet ached, my back burned, and without a second thought, I began ripping and tearing through my own clothes. My heartbeat throbbed in incessant rhythm, and I fell to my hands and knees, howling in pain like no other I had ever felt before. My fingers began to lengthen, and I dug them deep into the concrete floor. I heard my spine crack and dislocate as my shoulders all in one sickly thrust and roll. As I crouched there, sweat and phlegm and blood pouring off of me, the loudspeaker again came on and another command was given. Destroy him. I was suddenly blindsided by the newcomer and thrown into the concrete wall with a sickening crunch. Within seconds he was on me again and I was picked up and dumped onto my head, my skull making a disgusting clunk noise as it made contact with the cold, unforgiving surface. My vision swam in and out of sight. I had to do something, when out of nowhere, as this asshat tried to grab me up by my throat, I lashed out with my new improved snout full of pearly whites and sank my teeth through his hand, biting off four of his fingers and a third of his hand in doing so. Now the other one came swinging down to take my head clean off my shoulders and I caught it inches away from my face. I broke that arm in two without a second thought. His cries of anguish rang through the empty dome-like room. Then, before a second passed, I surrendered to the beast and I... <laughs> I was reborn again. Now, Tick said the last bit with such excitement and vigor that he almost fell off of his seat. And then Dave asked, Reborn again? What type of mumbo-jumbo is that? He means he ate the dude, you dumbass. Ultimately sealing his deal with a lycanthrope like curse and no doubt making his captors all the more happy. Jeez, Dave, sometimes, sometimes, I said exasperated with his negative attitude. Now my recollection of what transpired next is still a little sketchy, but I'll say this. Each of us were hanging on his every word as he recounted the first transformation and subsequent battle of life and death. I rose to my feet and stood at least a couple of feet taller than the guy in front of me. My chest heaved a mighty humming growl that seemed to shake the entire structure of the dome building. Then I saw it. I saw my reflection in one of the viewing parts built into the wall but up a ways. I saw the fear plastered on this poor soul before me's face. His pupils were they dilated to an almost all black eyeball. His lips were quivering and arms shaking as he clutched the broken appendage. Now the loudspeaker blasted on again and commanded that I eliminate him. I glanced back and he was cowering his head submissively. A spark of anger and rage boiled in my heart and I couldn't bring myself to do it. Now my anger, it was directed at the staff and medical professionals. And as I stared down at the poor soul before me, he suddenly uttered three words in Vietnamese I had heard on a number of occasions. Please, kill me. Tig was silent for a moment and collected himself whilst packing another heavy wad of tobacco into his pipe and chuffing a big cloud of grey smoke up into the rafters of his cabin. His old eyes teary and distant, the fire still burned in him before he once again was back with us. Tam near broke my heart. He was only a young fella like myself. A kid caught up in a political shit show and slowly drowning in a stagnant ditch full of blood and piss. And so as I stood there, I did what needed to be done placed my enormous hand on his shoulder before killing him. 
His tear-filled eyes, or he looked up at me, and a small smile swept across his face for the faintest of seconds. He nodded, as did I, and without a second to think, I slashed my claws across his throat and severed his head from his torso. <sighs> he was dead before his head hit the deck. Jeez, Tig, that's fucking awful. I'm so sorry you had to experience any of that. Stacy remarked, shocked by the tale of Tick's life. So, anyway, here's the good bit. As I was stood there, the loudspeaker came back on and that damn creepy-ass voice who starts commending me for my obedience has the cheek to say, Good boy. And I was furious. And if I'm honest, I was hungry. And so, as they were busy with their congratulations with each other, I set about devising a plan of escape. I looked to the ceiling and the high dome apex, and well, it was glass and looked to be only a regular security glass, nothing heavy duty at all. I guess they had underestimated my abilities as a werewolf, and that maybe I was their second one and obviously I was bigger than a little guy. Well, whatever the case, I saw an opening of escape, and where that led to, I had no idea, but I was working on a whim here. I remember that during my transformation and anger, I had managed to dig in and tear up the concrete floor. I mean literally, it was like potty to me. And so as they set about their routine and gathered with the security guards to enter and trank me, I flipped them the bird and began running in the outer circle of the room. Now I ran and ran until I had gathered enough speed before. I leapt and gripped onto the wall as I began leaping higher and higher up the dome concave wall. And as I got closer to the top and subsequent glass panel, before I and freedom, they spilled into the room one by one, twenty or so, and began trying to shoot me down with some sort of tactical tasers and the track darts. But before they could even get a beat on me, I jumped back down and ran my new enormous arms straight through them. I ploughed my hand into the chest of the first guy and proceeded to run with his dead corpse into the next guy's chest and out of his back too, throwing them to one side as I roared as pure power coursed through my body. I mean it was invigorating to say the least. The feeling of endless power was almost too much to take as the remaining men took a gasp and a cautionary step back before fixing their sights back on me. I leapt with such ferocity and dexterity and cut each of their remaining guards down like a slaughterhouse bank holiday rush. As the last man dropped lifeless to the floor and some of the medical professionals had already ran for their lives, I wasted no more time. I could hear the faint thumps of more security personnel and so made for my escape via sunroof. I got to the roof and began crawling low to the floor, being aware of my new size and shape. I had two watchtowers to my nine o'clock and one to my three o'clock. Nearby I could hear troops marching, left, right, left, right, left, and the rumbling of an engineer working on one of the MVs, direct to my twelve o'clock with the jungle. The vastness of that place was almost daunting at the time, but I inhaled a big heaving breath and let it out with a rumbling sigh. And then I was off. I leapt down from the roof and sprinted on two feet like a damn whippet. Before another second had passed and the alarm sounded. Those damn alarms, they stung my newfound waffling ears like a bitch. But I pursued the jungle tree line like it was Mother Mary herself welcoming me. Then jumping the first in a series of security fencing and wasting a few unlucky souls who chose to stand in between me and my salvation, I made the last fence jump and scurried into the canopy of the jungle treetops. The sirens rang out for hours and hours afterwards, and I made for a little waterfall I had come across a few months previously. I caught a deer on the way there and ate it, and then collapsed with my back against the cavern's wall. And I drifted off hearing the shouts and hollers of men who were sent to look for me, whilst I watched the water cascade down the mouth of the hidden cave. 
well, well, the rest is kind of history from there on. I made my way south to a little town that ran small charter planes and made my way around to Europe. I hung out in London for a decade or more, getting to grips with my new way of living. And then I finally returned to the great US of A. Our entire group sat transfixed, once again by Tick's life and the torture and treachery of which the US Army or government had subjected him to. Kathy and Stacy both were drying their eyes as Kathy got out another pack of pocket tissues and passed them to Stacy. And Tick cleared his throat and continued. Well, after a few years, I finally felt it was safe enough for me to come on home. Most of my family had either passed or had moved on and out onto greener grass. I moved back to my hometown and rented a house in a fake name, which I picked up whilst in London. You know, you can almost get anything in that city. A wondrous but equally dangerous place. Anyway, soon life was fit and settled. I had gotten a system going where I would head out to the country around four days prior to the transition. A couple of times I could have sworn I was being tailed and I caught a glimpse of a young man in his mid-twenties watching me from across the bar or in the supermarket. Or once on my way out of town and I stopped at the garage for gas. To be honest, I thought he either had a crush on me or was an agent sent to track me down. But then I never got a good look at him. He always seemed to disappear before I could act on anything. Now, the first few years, <laughs> they were a real mess. If you looked hard enough, you'd find a paper trail of news reports and such. <sighs> it was to be expected. Tick added with a deep regretful sigh. So, I uh, had worked up enough courage to start having a beer or two at the local watering hole. Nothing crazy, just a few beers and some pool. I met this young man called Johnny. Uh, he was a whiz with technology and hacking. I don't recall the specifics. But he was the shit. Had a real head on his shoulders too and didn't take any shit from nobody. Not even me. Anyway, we got to talking and it turned out it had been him that I was seeing from time to time. He was a bit of a loner and there weren't that many young folk of his age in the little town that we lived in. And so we started hanging out on a regular basis. And then one night he ran into a spot of trouble outside the bar. I had just left myself and was finishing up a good piss up against the dumpster when I heard the commotion and before I knew it, four big guys rounded the corner with Johnny by the scruff of his shirt. They threw him to the ground and started going to work on him real bad. I was back away so they hadn't even noticed me yet. And so, without a second thought, I stepped out into the light and declared that they leave him be and he'd had his fill. And well, being grade A asshats, they pay me no mind. And after all, I was only one old man, right? <laughs> Tick's eyes lit up again with that same fiery flame of excitement he had earlier today. He leaned forward in his chair and continued. And so, they tell me to fuck off, old timer, and beat it and whatnot. I just laughed at them, my head rising back and looking to the sky. I gave them the most cocky laugh I could muster and then faced them once more. But this time, I let out just a little bit of the beast inside. It was only two days to the full moon and the animal inside was itching to break free. My eyes reflected the street lights behind them and my canines grew out an inch or two. When all of a sudden one of the guys, he takes a step towards me and before I could stop myself, I lunged, sinking my teeth into his face. His comrades dropping, the battered and bruised Johnny, and taking two steps back in panicked retreat. Now Johnny seemed to be pretty out of it, so I thought it'd be okay. And as they fell over themselves, I threw my arms out wide, claws bursting from my fingers and roared a tremendous roar. As they fleed for their lives, crying <laughs> and whimpering. Now they're of a pal. Well, he was already dead in the gutter before the cries had faded. Down near half of the bar flew out of the doors a couple of seconds later. I saw the guys disappearing down the road as I was helping Johnny back up. His head rolled and dropped drunkenly, and blood ran in a long drool streak from his mouth. Now, he was beaten and bruised, but 
he would live to fight another day. Now the folks at the bar called the ambulance and the police arrived at the coroner. After being questioned and taking our statements, we were let go. Ha! <laughs> the damn bar staff made a statement that the guys who had fled were from out of town and had caused trouble the night before. They thought that they had attacked Johnny and the guy and that I had intervened and saved the day. And well, to be honest, I sighed a big sigh of relief as I thought I had messed up letting the beast get the better of me. But with the statement soon, everything passed over. I guess now looking back, that could have been what led to them tracing my whereabouts. Uh, them. I asked a little lost for a second before Tick clarified it for me. Yeah, them. You see, once you are the government's property, once they have invested in you in one way or another, they're going to keep an eye on your whereabouts. <laughs> Especially if you're a newly transformed werewolf. And with that, Tick laughed a booming hearty laugh, and a couple of us joined in. In the months that passed, Johnny worked up the courage to ask me if he saw what he saw that night, if I really was a monster. I corrected him and said I was a werewolf, not through choice nor birth, and that the government had carried out some tests and trials using my curse for their gains. And I explained that I too was on the run and had been back in town only a few months. I didn't know how he was going to take it or if I should have killed him right there and then, but, but something told me not to, and that Johnny was like a son I never had or would have. And yeah, I guess that's what I was thinking. Hell, I had to be crazy looking back, but he was a good kid and had done right by me. And so soon after our defense at the bar, I started noticing strange vans parked up around my neighborhood, especially close to my house. And I started to get a little nervous and paranoid, and so I asked Johnny to try and wipe my records from the government systems. Hell, everything I had at that time was in a fake ID name anyway. And so he set about working his magic, and after around three days and about $30 in energy drinks, he had it. My medical records, my social security number, hell, even my driver's license and registration. Everything that had been collected throughout my life, well, it was there on screen. Are you sure you want to do this? Johnny asked me and I told him yes, I was certain. And then with a few clicks of the mouse do hickey and bam, I no longer existed. Now we high-fived and had a couple of beers in celebration. And then moments later, it happened. And the damn computer screen blinked on to a green page and it was all sorts of information and emblems. What was clear to me and from Johnny's reaction, and the government had clocked what we had done and were now tracing our position. And we had no control over the computer, and so we grabbed our shit and headed for the truck. Ah, Johnny had a beat-up hardtop Nova. And boy, could that car move. It was his pride and joy. But nevertheless, it was useless where we were headed. I needed to disappear again, and the only thing I could think to do was to head for the trees. Head for the swamp and go deeper than anyone would ever do before. Somewhere nobody would ever look for me. And so we jumped into my beauty, my lifted Bronco. Now here was a machine. I ain't never felt so much power from any other truck. I bought it at an auction, and some douchebag drug dealer from out in the sticks had it repoed. If there was anything that could get me down those country lugging roads, it was that beauty right there. And so, without a second to spare, we jumped in and burst from my garage, taking a hard left down the country road, leading up and out of town. Our destination was Barn Swamp. And whilst we were leaving the town back a ways in the opposite direction, I could make out the blue lights flashing in a long line that slowly faded with shaky heat rays over the horizon. We left not a minute too soon. Now, eventually, after hours and hours of roads, we reached our destination. And I had always been one to plan ahead, especially after my services to that country. And so I had this scenario already mapped out in my head. And Tick leaned forward again and waggled his eyebrows again as he said, Never leave a paper trail for someone to find, wherever it is, that you're going to hide. 
So anyways, we reach as far as the oldest logging road I could find could take us. We hop out and make our way on foot. Now at this point we're thinking Johnny can still return home after a few days and everything has cooled down. But we was wrong. You see, when they raided my property, they found Johnny's driver's license and his fingerprints, well, they were all over the computer. They had us banged to rights and so it looked like I was in for some company. Ah, the kid took it well, to be honest. He seemed unfazed by the notion of the USA government and intelligence agencies now being aware that he had skills that posed a threat to them. I gotta say, it felt good to get one over on them. <laughs> Still does, in fact. After a few days, we settled into a routine and I had gathered enough supplies, including what I had in the back of the truck, to last us both a couple of weeks. I even built an underground smoker, so... There'd be no smoke signal, and we could still enjoy some jerky. We trekked back and hid the truck in some heavy, dense undergrowth in tarpaulin. Ah, you could walk right past it, and you'd never know it was there. And as the days turned to weeks, we soon started to relax and thought we had made for a great escape. Hell, I started naming Johnny McLean, after Steve McLean, in the Great Escape movie. He would call me Gov in similar respect. And all in all, life, huh, all life was actually good. But alas, Lady Fate had other ideas for us both in our lifetime. A tick very suddenly took on a dark and somber appearance. His shoulders sagged and his facial features screwed up into a deep frown as he stared at the fireplace, the flames of which reflecting vividly in his good eye he sighed a deep sigh and cleared his throat before trying to muster a smile but I could see the corners of his mouth never met his eyes yeah a dark day was indeed upon us sooner than either of us could ever have prepared a month or so passes and we relax ourselves a little with some shine we managed to make our thoughts are to our next move and if there even needs to be one Johnny speaks of wanting for a wife at some point in his life, but for now he was content on staying with me and seeing my story through to the end. I agreed and said we should give it another six months or so and maybe we could make a slip for Mexico. Well, Johnny thought it was a great idea and we settled down to rest after a great day and night of drinking and shooting the shit. Now, I like your regular, normal werewolf lore. I soon found out after breaking out and escaping that my transformation, well, it wasn't governed by the moon cycle. No, my curse, my gift, my ability, it has been tampered with by the greatest minds of the US government. In doing so, they gave me the ability to change whenever I want. Now, it took some learning, especially when talking about control over the beast. But eventually, I grasped my abilities by the nuts and continued to develop my skills. Such as my eyesight and dexterity was increased tenfold. Well, except for this one here. And <laughs> tick points to his scarred eye. So, anyways, my strength continues to grow beyond ridiculous. <laughs> I'm shocked myself at how far I can jump or how long I can run for. But that night, or that night we had been drinking from earlier that day, our minds and bodies were completely out of whack. Especially mine, seeing as I'm over here with like three minds in my body. Ha ha ha. Tick laughed that same hearty chuckle before he continued. So, as we're sleeping and dreaming of a better life in Mexico, my senses were awoken a short time later into the early hours of the morning to a noise from out of camp. At first, in my hazy state, I didn't register what was going on to even be aware of a problem. Then a stick cracked, not too far out from our firelight. It was loud enough to grasp my attention, and there, before me, and just a few steps behind poor Johnny, was another werewolf. Hell, his fur was a hue of black that swallowed the light of fire, and any and all shadows around it were meek in comparison. His sinister scowl and glimmering eyes glowed and shimmered in the firelight. I sat up suddenly in shock and amazement and quickly sprang into my feet and transforming in a matter of seconds. 
but the time it had taken me to transform into my waffen form. I looked and the beast had Johnny by his throat. A damn sinister smirk registered in his face and poor Johnny whimpered as he awoke to this new terror. T tick He asked shakily and breathing heavily from shock and fear. I took a step towards them and a werewolf growled and dragged Johnny back about six feet, kicking up the dry leaves and dirt as it did so. Now it was nearly a week off from the next full moon and that rang alarm bells straight away for me. I mean, isn't it the normal werewolf law, supposed to be surrendering to the beast only on the full moon, right? Again, Tick's bushy eyebrows bounced up and down. He certainly was a character. So anyway, I tried to reason, using mindspeak telepathy, we werewolves can use. Ah, it's too difficult to explain right now, but perhaps another time. I immediately ask it what it is doing here and to release poor Johnny, as he is just a kid after all. Now the wolfman sneers at me and explains that this is his swamp and his only, and we are trespassing. I go on to explain our situation, and the beast seems puzzled by my request to surrender Johnny and take a breath. I explain further that we are on the run and I suspect he is too, given his ability to change whenever he likes. Now the Wolfman, he goes on to explain that he was one of the first, the first in a series of tests and procedures, and that his brother was the first to be captured alive, and so he was brought in to the facility for further tests. And there he was tested upon and made into what he is today, a werewolf. He, like myself, had escaped from a facility and made his way to the swamp some 50 years previous. After reassuring him we are of no threat on my own plots, he finally releases a dazed and breathless Johnny. He was cut and shook up, but overall he was okay. We spend that morning talking around the campfire and reminiscing about easier years gone by. The Wolfman introduces himself as Wallace and that he had made his way here to the USA almost 60 years ago on a rainy night. On arrival, he lived in New Orleans, and there he met his demise at the hands of the crooked government. From there, he was subjected to many trials and tests, and eventually, after almost seven years of torture and deprivation of the mind, soul, and body, he made his escape. He said that he had fished here whilst on holiday as a child with his grandfather, who raised him. And Barn Swamp was as the most wild and rugged place in the world that he could think of and that it was not unfeasibly too far from a facility, but still far enough for comfort. And soon after his escape, he realized just how far from human he had become, and chose to remain hidden in Barn Swamp for the rest of his life. And now, all these years down the line, Wallace was as far from civilized as one could obtain, in his human form, which he refused to show us for almost a full day. He was tall and a stocky built man with grey hair and an intimidating eyebrows and eyes. Now he sat like a dog or more akin to a wolf and ate like a hungry hound dog. To say he made good company, well, that was a big request. Hell, he smelled like he laid in or that he killed and pissed all over himself regularly. He had to go. As such, a showdown was in order and I had to hide on this son of a gun. And so, after he stayed a while, a couple of days, maybe a week, I got dear Johnny to go fetch some fish from down river a ways. So, he'd be out of the situation when it went down. Now, Johnny never was the sharp one, now was he? Dear old Johnny couldn't take the hint and kept asking why this and why that. Man, I swear, I was going to kill him myself. <laughs> anyway, he got the hint and trekked off with the basket and his tackle box and rod. We'd leave the basket for a couple of days and check in on it later on for fish and whatnot. And so, then it was just me and old Wallace, the Scottish bastard. I didn't want to full-on kill him, but he needed to get the message, and fast. And so, after an hour and Johnny was long gone, I asked him out right there and then. You know, we ain't ever leaving this here swamp, at least not any time soon. And especially not on your say-so. And to be frank, Wallace, 
I don't like you much. Ah, is that right, her tick? He huffed like some lazy-ass cougar or something. Didn't I already tell you boys that you was guests in my swamp? He barked, no pun intended. Ah, just hold on a sec. I counted, but he had bitten and was not letting go. You know I'm going to kill him, right? Yeah, young Johnny has a date with the devil. There ain't shite that you're going to do about it. He screamed, and I was sure if Johnny didn't know what was up before, then he sure did now. Without a second to lose, I chucked my copper shine and ripped off my shirt as thick black and grey fur sprouted from my chest, shoulders and back, all the way down to my toes. I flexed my enormous arms and hands as I stared this son of a bitch down before me. His transformation was just as quick, and he jumped forward to lunge from my throat with razor-sharp claws. I dodged and snarled a sinister snarl that shook the trees around us and blew the hairs on his mane backwards with the force from my lungs. And I was enraged at the sheer audacity and sheer asshat behavior he had shown. I mean, sure, he has spent years alone in this here swamp, but fuck me. Come on, asshole. Lighten up. You have fucking guess. Cease this immoral bullshit immediately and file back. I growled at my chest heaving and lungs full of air as I tried to control my ferocious instincts. We needed a solution, not a war. I couldn't afford Johnny getting hurt if this prick, or if he got away. Fuck you. You Americans take all of what you want and need but give so little. Ain't fucking around. I'll tear you and him to shreds, laddie. Oh yeah, and let's see about that. I declared, and with that, I stepped forward and circled the campfire, defensively. My long arms out at either side, and Draw was hanging, already in anticipation of the fight. The blood that would flow from his arteries was almost mesmerizing. He made the first move, and he leapt with his arms outstretched and claws extended, ready for my throat. When out of nowhere, Johnny appeared and unloads his three fifty-seven Magnum with a hair trigger. Why, it blows away the lower portion of his jawbone, and two more shots hit his torso, setting him sprawling into a heap the side of the fire. Then I set upon him as fast as I could manage, and try to subdue him as best I can. And after a few quick punches to the cranium, he sees sense, and finally, he calms down. And breathlessly, I gather myself as Johnny runs up closer, and keeps the trigger trained on Wallace. After a moment or so has passed and we all sit back taking in what just transpired. Eventually Wallace agreed to a truce and he realized we were only here to survive, not take. We only needed a place to lay low for a while and wouldn't actually be a problem given how vast this swamp was. And so he did leave us alone, but he left us with a thought in mind for future reference. He said that we weren't the only werewolves in Barn Swamp and that there is another like us, enhanced and loose without a moral in place. He said this other wolfman is stronger than normal and a cunning son of a bitch. If he didn't know we were already here, then he would be paying us a visit before the month was out. And as the early evening crept ever closer and Wallace was happy with the answers we gave him to his questions, which again... If I'm frank, was more like an interrogation than simply questions. <laughs> a truce was settled. Anyway, he left the next day's night, and that was the last that I ever see of him. As far as I know, he is still out here somewhere. I used to get his scent, now and then, around the boundaries of my territory, but I, but I, in recent years, it has been few and far between. And I hope he has found peace, in some respect. The rabid bastard. <laughs> We all laughed our ass off as Tick rolled up with laughter and settled back down once more. Then, a couple of weeks later, as we were doing a spot of fishing, we hear the brush and sticks start crackling as if someone is coming our way. Moments later, some tall and lanky guy with greasy hair, well, he walks out of the tree line and shouts a hello, like it's a normal place for an evening stroll. Soon he came and sat with us a spell and we shared some coffee with him. The whole time he was sat talking up a storm and 
I noticed that Johnny, well, he was unusually quiet. It seems our guest had also picked up the vibe, pouring off at Johnny and, well, he came right out with it. What's your problem, boy? The stranger said with a venomous twang. No, no problems here. Johnny countered, but I didn't like how Johnny was reacting and I didn't much care for strangers and abrupt questions. So I said, now nah, just hang on a second. And well, he straight up pulled a long machete from his back sheath, points it straight at Johnny and asked him again. I said, what's your problem, boy? Well, this time he raises to his feet. I stand in reaction and glare at him with a hateful scorn across my face. He looks from I to Johnny and then back to me. A small, crooked smile flashed over his face and a second later, he takes a lunge at Johnny's throat. That Johnny dove out the way as the stranger raises the machete high above himself, ready to swing it down through poor Johnny's midsection. I hesitate no more and seize the long blade in my hands, its sharp cold steel edge instantly cutting into my fingers and palms. The stranger turns to look at me, and I see the madness in his eyes. A cold, dead blackness resides deep within them. I could tell straight away, this man, well, he was a killer. This man we had welcomed for all of ten minutes has no issue in slaying poor young Johnny, and probably I as well. Well, I wasn't about to let that happen, now was I? In fact, I could smell the scent of death wafting off of this guy. Now he was no normal civilian. And so, without a second to think, I burst into my wolfen form, snatching the crude blade from his hands and bending it in two before chucking it back into his arms. He caught it dumbstruck by the sight before him. A real life monster and something much more dangerous than his sick and twisted temper. He dropped the crumpled blade and made a run for it, straight up diving into the river and swimming away to the other bankside. I glanced at Johnny who was still catching a colour back in his face and he smiled at me. And with a nod, I launched after the stranger, catching up with him quickly as he scrambled up the muddy bankside opposite Johnny and I's camp spot. I drag him back down and he's kicking and screaming up something terrible. And so before I gain my conscience and let him escape, I raise him up to meet my eye and growl a tremendous chest rattling growl. The stranger urinates himself and whimpers in reaction. He then spits at me and I waste no more time. I rip out his throat and throw him, leaving his body to float down river for the critters. I return to a shook up Johnny, trying to roll a cigarette with shaking hands. I returned to my human form and sat with him in silence for a number of minutes before he spoke. He was... Johnny began trembling terribly. He was a serial killer. I recognize his face from the flyers and the news reports. He's been on the run for three years in five different states. He went by the cannibal killer and the authorities believe he was responsible for over a hundred deaths. Maybe more. Johnny's eyes trailed after the bloodstained mud on the other side of the river. Well, he ain't shit now, kid, but cougar food. Good riddance, I say. I told him as I rested an arm around his shoulder and patted his back. And we sat there as the sun went down and he recalled all that this sickle had done. Anyway, weeks went by and with no further threat from Wallace or <laughs> any new visitors. We resumed a happy-go-lucky lifestyle. Our drinking sessions would be stuff of legend had any other fucking soul been around to witness it. <laughs> but alas, as our good things, they had to come to an end. And Tick paused for a few minutes before packing his pipe and sipping back to smoke it. The warmth of the fire warming our souls as Tick relayed these tales of misfortune and woe. And then he began telling us another of his deepest, darkest truths. Something reminded me of the older folk in town and how they would lean on each other for support and comfort at times of distress. <sighs> Communities were closer back then and everyone shared each other's plight and worries. Anyways, Tick continued. 
Ah, Johnny was a smart kid, as I mentioned, and had a grasp on technology and information better than a Harvard professor. Over the course of a few months, and him taking trips to and from the swamp back to another town, 50 miles away, he had been researching and asking around on the shark net about wet wo- I cut in and asked before Tick could finish. Uh, sorry, Tick. The shark net? Do you mean the dark net or deep websites? I think that's what you mean. <laughs> I laughed and he and the others joined me as he nodded and agreed. Ah, that was it. Yeah, so anyways, he had been digging around on the internets and found a thing or two about the werewolf curse. Turns out old Johnny had a certain recipe that could kill a wolfman in less than a minute. A strange concoction told to him by some guy in Germany who was into dark crafts and magic. Guy straight up offers Johnny $100,000 to bring me to him or him to me. Of course, Johnny covered himself and gave no indication of where I was located. He burnt the trail, as he called it, and came back to me with a get-out solution. See, it wasn't just something that could kill a werewolf. No, Johnny had been digging and the guy in question said he believed that a certain method and chant or incantation could relieve me of this burden. The only issue we had was that, as far as the German guy, uh, Klaus or Nick Klaus I think it was called, as far as he could decode from the old text written on a piece of sheepskin by God knows who back a millennia ago, was that it required the blood of a virgin, the first flower of the Hawthorne, and three other components that he, nor I, or Johnny could translate. And so, we eventually gave up for the time being, at least. I mean, it was driving us crazy. We had the answer, but just couldn't read it. And the weeks and weeks went by, and we settled back down and were preparing for the winter. If it was anything to go by the last winter season, then it was going to be bone cold and probably a good chance of snow with it, too. At least the deer will be easier to see. I remember thinking. And so we hunkered down as the nights got long and the wind brought biting chills to every nook and cranny. It was soon exploited by the wind and winter's pursuit to kill us both. And then it cleared for a couple of days and Johnny suggested that he would go further upstream and try his hand at fishing a few miles down river. Ah, from the start I didn't like it, but well, he was a young and adventurous man and I'd be damned if I was going to hold him back. And so the next morning, it was still nice and clear, and with not a cloud in the sky. He left with enough rations for a couple of days and nights, maybe. His backpack and tackle box in tow. We had spent the week before teaching him how to weave a basket for catching fish. It wasn't much, but I'm sure he expected to catch something. And we said our goodbyes, and he parted ways off in an east-north-easterly direction. And we plans to link back up with a river two miles down at the Beaver Dam. There he would cross over and make his journey to the uncharted territory. And I watched him walk off, stumbling as he did so, his rod, backpack and tackle box rattling away until he disappeared over the crest of the hill over there. A tick pointed to the rise in the land off some sixty feet or so. And well, that, that was the last time I see him. Wow, 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 wow. Hopefully another one. Wow. Absolutely chest-pounding, action-packed, and a little bit for everyone storyline there. Hope you guys and girls enjoyed that one as much as I have writing it. Lots more in a pipeline. As I mentioned when we kicked this off four months ago, this is going to be a running series. I'm going to keep going and making and developing the storyline and characters. I thought that was quite a good angle to kind of reminisce and take a a walk back in time and learn how Tick became what he is today. Of course, as ever though, please do let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. Why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you're an aspiring writer or would just like to have a crack at things like myself, please do get in touch with me at the usual email as on screen, which is dmtforestoffear at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope everybody's well and happy this week. 
getting stuck into school or work, whatever it is that you do, and trying to keep fit and focused during these testing times. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>